Okay. All right. My computer shut down. All right. You may continue. Okay. Okay. I just totally forgot where I was trying to get you back were on here. You talking about what um, the Court of Appeals decided and that, and that you had filed a rehearing with them because you disagreed with their... Um, action in regards to or their their statement that you were in privity right um, so that I'm just saying that the issue of privity is irrelevant because the the fact of the matter is that the um, Stephen Scow was instructed by Red Rock um, pursuant to the law to um, deposit remit to the court the excess proceeds that they gave him in a check with a memo instructing him to interplead them. And if he had interpled these um, in 2014 as instructed by his Red Rock client, um, none of this litigation would have been necessary. But it's, it, it's necessary because I filed a civil claim for him in 2017. I didn't get it. I went to mediation to get it in 2018, didn't get it. In 2019, I filed a second action. And Red Rock or, or Stephen Scow or whoever filed a motion to dismiss it because of this um, privity idea. But actually, the, the elements of claims preclusion, the elements of res judicata cannot be met if the thing has never been adjudicated. Those, those proceeds have never been distributed. So if it's dismissed, my claim for them, is dismissed with prejudice there and if you're saying I don't get them or I don't get any interest or I don't get any penalties because I've been obstructed from getting them for eight years well then who gets them? Stephen Scow? Who gets them? All right. I'm they don't have any directly, interest. Red Rock? Or Ms. Tobin I'm going to read to you directly the issue of claim preclusion the reason why the issue of privity is important is because it goes directly to the issue of claim preclusion and you can't have claim preclusion if the people that you're trying to preclude were not parties to the prior lawsuit. The reason the Court of Appeals said that the district court was correct in dismissing your case on the grounds of claim preclusion is because they found that there was privity. And that's why the claim preclusion argument and the privity is important and what was the basis for the dismissal in the second action. I'm also going to read directly from the Court of Appeals case where it says, in light of the foregoing, Tobin fails to show that her claim to the excess proceeds in the underlying action could not have been litigated between the relevant privies in the prior action. Now, to the extent that you're saying that Mr. Scow, and I'm going to allow Mr. Fawnen to make a record on this, but to the extent that you're saying that Mr. Scow did not interplead the funds with the court, it becomes a harmless error. It wouldn't have mattered if he interpled the funds with the court or if they would have brought a, a complaint as they did in this case that is before me, this A21828840 Red Rock Financial Services versus Nona Tobin et al., to find out who they should distribute those funds to. And it's perfectly legitimate for Mr. Scow to have said, I'm not going to do anything with these funds until all of the underlying litigation has been taken care of. Um, that being said, I've told you before, and this is probably the fifth time that I've said it, I'm not saying that you're not entitled to these interpled funds. And to the extent that Nation Star and Wells Fargo have not made a claim to them, and there was a complaint that was filed by Red Rock, and if Nation Star and Wells Fargo didn't answer the complaint and say, we are, we are seeking our monies off of these, then yes, the funds would go to you. But that's the reason for the interpleader. That's the reason that this complaint was filed so that Mr. Scow, when he does distribute the funds, 
knows where they're supposed to go to. That's the whole purpose of an interpleader action. Can you give me a legal um, site or authority for him to keep the money for eight years when the law says they are to be distributed after the sale? I'm saying Period. It, it doesn't would, say I, wait until no all the litigation. Site, there is no site for that, ma'am. Because there's no Ms. legal authority Ms. Tobin, for it. please stop speaking over me or I'm going to have to put you on mute. So when I start talking, I need you to stop talking so that we can create a clear record, okay? What I'm saying is, is that if he kept them in his IOLTA account, which I'm not sure if he did or not, if he kept them in his IOLTA account, they're protected. And there's nothing that, uh, that them being in his IOLTA account is no different than them being in an interpleader account with the court. As a matter of fact, it's probably better because it's earning interest, right? Yes, Your Honor. So, to the extent that the funds are kept in an IOLTA account, they're safe. They're audited by our Supreme Court every year. That's the whole purpose of having an IOLTA account, is you keep funds. It's like if you have a personal injury lawsuit and the insurance company cuts, you a, che cuts a check to the plaintiff, it goes into the attorney's IOLTA account first for purposes of distributing those funds later on. It's perfectly safe and perfectly legitimate under IOLTA rules. Um, they aren't in an IOLTA account. They are. They were in an IOLTA account. Hmm. Just for clarity, Your Honor. Yes. They, I, I cannot speak to them. A specific IOLTA account given that we do a lot of work with Red Rock right they, they are in a trust account that may be specifically Red Rock okay. proceeds but okay. they are in a trust account okay they're in a trust account it it's wouldn't have mattered if they were in a trust, trust. the I only way that it would have mattered Miss Tobin is if somehow they weren't there anymore that's the only way that it would have mattered but they are still there. That's the reason that they filed this action, so that they could know who to appropriately distribute them to. So, that being said, what's before me is the interpleader action. Now, you're not entitled to interest on these he funds. Just to get, keep it for eight years. It is not in an IOLTA account. You're not entitled to interest on these funds, and you're also not entitled to attorney's fees based on the decision that was rendered by the Court of Appeals. You're entitled to the funds. That's the only thing that's before the court. If I may, Your Honor. You may. Your Honor, I'll be brief. Um, and part of it I'm going to cover because it ties into our counter motion. Um, as your court just point out, there is no legal basis for her claim for interest. There is no legal basis for her to find Mr. Scow, and I take exception to the uh, disparaging comments that have been leveled against Mr. Scow. Um, he's acted appropriately throughout this case. He's acted within the scope of his agency. And, and, and our firm has. There's no basis to find him personally, legal basis to find him personally liable. She ignores the fact that the reason that the, the funds weren't interpled was because from the outset she has been trying to unwind the sale. If we were to interplead the funds they were distributed to her, then the, the sale gets unwound. We're in a, we're in a whole new predicament where the, the funds are now you know, been released and there's a liability issue. Right. Had she not proceeded up until last year trying to unwind the sale, the funds would have been interpled years ago. As far as attorney's fees and costs, and as far as the, the, the excess proceeds, we've made it clear, the excess proceeds, um, the rem what remains of them after any award of attorney's fees and costs, which we're entitled to, uh, and I'm going to draw the court's attention to, in our, our papers, we, we cited to the Innisbrook uh, ruling, in which the Supreme Court said <clears throat> that we were entitled to attorney's fees and costs 
for any litigation that arose as a result of a foreclosure, not just the foreclosure itself. Um, and we cite to that on page 10 of our, our opposition. Well, And then, Your Honor, um, and again, all of this has been necessary because there's been repeated uh, filings and motions and appeals by Ms. Tobin in an attempt to unwind the sale. All of this is relevant because the court, at the last hearing, and I'm going to read from the transcript, made it very clear to Ms. Tobin, <clears throat> and when it said, The court is going to warn Ms. Tobin at this juncture that in the event that she continues to file seriatim, seriatim. Seriatim, excuse me, my pronunciation, motions with this court, that the court will have no other choice but to file an order to show cause to declare her a vexatious litigant and at that time would entertain the opposition sides, uh, the opposition's uh, side from attorney's fees and costs. The fact of the matter is, this court made it very, very clear to her in that hearing. I was on that blue jeans. Mm -hmm. Made it very clear to her that her legal standing was solely for the, uh, a claim for the excess proceeds. And that if she filed any claims, de and I quote the court, devoid of legal merit, that the court would have no other choice but to uh, uh, have her uh, uh, file an order to show cause to, ha to discuss whether to deem her a vexatious litigant. I think we're here at this point, Your Honor, because five days, five days, not even a full week after this motion, or after the order was entered from that hearing, Ms. Tobin files her second amended motion where she again makes these wild accusations personally attacks Mr. Scout for, for uh, fraud and conspiracy and any litany of other accusations, not just a claim for the, the excess proceeds. Clearly, she, and then she files 500 pages of exhibits to go along with it. Your Honor, clearly we are at a point where a vexatious litigant order is absolutely appropriate because otherwise it's just going to keep going round and round and round and if your honor awards us attorney's fees and costs that, that we subtract from the excess proceeds which we would be allowed to do that will open up another avenue where we will be right back here because Ms. Tobin has shown that she is incapable of just following this court's orders and, and not overly litigating this matter. Unless Your Honor has any other issues, I think Your Honor has already covered most of it. I know Your Honor has met, read our opposition. And I think at this point, Your Honor, we would ask that we be allowed to submit a, a, a memorandum of fees and costs, that we be allowed to subtract that from the uh, excess proceeds that we are still holding, and that this court enter an order to show cause to have Ms. Tobin deemed a vexatious litigant so that we can stop this, so that our client doesn't have to keep incurring fees and costs over these frivolous, legally baseless uh, filings by Ms. Tobin. Well, and here's, here's my thought on it. Um, before I let you speak, Ms. Tobin, I'm gonna tell you what my thought is on it because her motion was an amended motion for an order to distribute interpled funds with interest to sole claimant Nona Tobin um, and motion for attorney's fees and costs pursuant to NRS 18.010 and EDCR 7.60. To the extent that that is the title of her motion, I understand that there were exhibits that were attached, that there were statements that were made in the motion but those were filed before the Court of Appeals came out with its decision. And to the extent that this court said that the only thing that she should be looking at is the interpled funds, 
I don't know that I necessarily believe that the current motion that's before me right now is outside of what is happening within this case. I understand that she is spending a majority of her motion re-arguing her position she's raised in other motions um, and in other filings, um, but to the extent that the Court of Appeals just came out with that decision, if she had filed it after the Court of Appeals said no, 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 they got it right and, and these claims are precluded, I, I think I would tend to agree with you. But Your Honor had had said all those things. Your Honor had told her that there was no legal merit to her claims when she filed her motion to reconsider. I, I, I respect the court's uh, thoughts, but at the same time, she was told this by this court at the January 19th hearing. But to the extent that she's making an argument, she's trying to make an argument as to why she should be receiving fees and costs and interest on the interpled funds. The interpled funds is something that I said that she could be filing. About. But then she went beyond that, Your Honor, with special damages for fraud and conspiracy and asking for, in essence, seven point, or excuse me, $3.73 million okay. from Red Rock or Mr. Scout personally. I think, I mean, I understand. Well, but how much, how much additional time did you spend on that part of your motion? But we had to address all of her claims and right. her re rehashing of those things. And I think that's, if, had this been, Your Honor, a, a simple, I'm entitled to the excess funds, give them to me, then we, as we've stated, we have no opposition to whatever the remaining funds are going to her. It's our, it, our issue is we had to spend the time to draft a, 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 a reply right. or an opposition. Right well in excess of, of anything we would have had to do had she just simply done what this court ordered. She added all of these extra minutiae that we had to address. We had no choice because if we didn't address it, 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 it stands. It's admitted. I, I understand. And, and, and I mean, that's the point is right. it, she can, as a bad analogy, you can put lipstick on a pig, Your Honor, but at the end of the day, it's still a pig. And she can call it whatever she wants. But when she wrote, when she filed her motion, her motion included well beyond the scope, and and included things that this court had specifically told her not to do. Right, and that were precluded. Um, let me, but let me ask you technically, because how much more time did you spend on addressing those other issues? Can you can you delineate that? Absolutely, we can provide billing because, Your Honor. As we said, we we stated right from the outset of our opposition, we have no opposition to her getting right. funds. Everything else after that one paragraph is what we were forced to respond to. So our billing for basically the 99.9% .9 of preparing this opposition for reviewing, for reviewing her pleadings and her gigantic uh, exhibits and, and, and then replying to this, reviewing her, her multiple uh, replies to our opposition, and then appearing here today, those are all costs that my client, our Well, client, you still would have had to appear. Well, but not if we didn't have to oppose. We would not have had to appear because the court would have granted it as unopposed because- If all we were dealing with was the excess was proceeds. Was the excess proceeds. We would not have had to be here at all Again, it goes to, the, from the very outset, our, our initial statement was we have no opposition to her being de determined to be, or whoever the court determines to be de uh, uh, the recipient of the excess proceeds, whatever remaining proceeds there are. But unfortunately, that's not what she filed. Right. She filed something that, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse because heaven knows that horse has been beat to death throughout the last eight years. But we're here because she was told no and she was told what not to file and she turned around and filed it. She could dress it up any other way she wants, but it's still, at the end of the day, we had to expend all this time, myself and Mr. Scow, in addressing this and being present here and dealing and reviewing all of her pleadings. So I think that 
right. on that alone, she, she falls within this court's last order that makes a vexatious litigant order appropriate. I'm not going to issue a vexatious litigant order, but I am going to award attorney's fees. Um, Your Honor, may I speak? You may. Okay, so just dealing with the interpleader issue. The, um, in 2014, the, um, I contacted Red Rock after the sale. And I wanted to request how to make a claim for those proceeds. And I was told by Red Rock that um, they are given to the court. I'm going to listen to it. Okay, I just, that's hearsay. That's all I was going to object as. I'm going to listen to it. No, I'm, I, this is me. No, I what, did what this. Red Rock told you is technically hearsay, and the court cannot okay. base its decisions on hearsay. Okay, I'm just telling you what happened, and that this is documented in um, the exhibits to um, Red Rock's motion to dismiss. That I did this, I asked for it, and that the um, I was told... And this is in a, an email in the in the court record that I was told that um, the court would decide and that I would be given a notice to um, you know when it was time to file a claim. So I never was given a notice, and that was 2014 in September. And then in January of 2017, there were no there was no no litigation related to the. Um, excess proceeds until I filed the claim for him because I never received notice that they would be distributed. The law specifically states that they are to be distributed after the sale, not after they decide whether there's going to be litigation later in life. So for two years, nothing. They could have distributed and had no liability, had no necessity to go to court. But what they did they couldn't was have distributed they opposed Ms. Tobin. Ms. Tobin, listen to me very carefully. They couldn't have distributed because you were trying to unwind the sale. If they distributed, no, it, no. listen to me. Listen to me. Do not talk over me, Ms. Tobin. Listen. You were attempting to unwind the sale. If they distribute those proceeds and the sale is unwound and the parties need to be set back to the place that they originally were, and you get $57,000 in proceeds, and you turn around and spend them, and you don't have, and, and then you don't have them once the sale, if, it, if the sale would have been unwound, and you don't have them, then the parties cannot be placed back into the same position that they would have been placed in. So there was no way that they could have distributed them to you, which is the reason why they needed to hold on to them. There was a, also, Your Honor, just for clarity, in yes. 2015 there was a quiet title that was filed that also were mandated that we hold on to them until the quiet title was, was, was done. done. Right. So, that, so it's not two and a half years. Literally in 2015, the quiet title was filed. So right. again, that held up. So we also have the quiet title action in 2015 that required based on that order that they be held. So they had to hold on to these funds until all of this litigation was essentially done, which is why now that the Tobin versus Chiesi claim has come down from the Court of Appeals, now is the time that it's appropriate for this court to order that those funds, those excess funds, be distributed. However, the problem is, is that you keep on trying to make the same argument over and over and over again after this department, this court, myself, Department 8, has told you <coughs> these claims are claim precluded. These claims cannot be brought. You cannot make these arguments anymore, and you continue to do so. And so for on that basis, the court is going to 
award the excess proceeds, but it is going to allow the defense counsel, which you will have an op or plaintiff's counsel, which you will have an opportunity to, um, which you will have an opportunity to file any opposition to this, limited <clears throat> to only the arguments that they make, not attempting to relitigate anything else. Because here's the problem. You put all of this excess stuff in your defendant Nova Tobin's pro se second amended motion for an order to distribute interpleted funds with interest to sole claimant Nona Tobin and motion for attorney's fees and costs. You put all of this additional argument and stuff in there. And if they wouldn't have filed an opposition to that, then under EDCR 2.20, it's ruled as unopposed and therefore is viewed as being meritorious. So by you including all of this additional argument that you included, you required them to file an opposition so that it didn't go unopposed and then you were able to argue that it was meritorious because they didn't oppose it. And since this court previously told you that you are not to make those types of arguments anymore, you therefore necessarily increased the cost of litigation and under EDCR 7.60, the plaintiffs are entitled to their attorney's fees for that. Now, the I am not awarding, as I said the last time, I am not going to go back and retroactively award all of the other attorney's fees that have been incurred in this interpleader action up until this point, I am only awarding the fees that were going that are that were incurred in opposing this most recent motion. Understood, Your Honor. All right. I am also not going to declare you a vexatious litigant at this point, but if you continue, if you file anything in opposition to their motion for attorney's fees and costs that deals with anything other than their actual fees and costs that they are asserting for doing this opposition, i.e., you don't think that they should have had to spend this amount of time. That would be a legitimate argument. You saying, Mr. Scow is a fraudster and he always writes really long motions in order to beef up his claims would not be an appropriate argument. Do you understand the distinction, Ms. Tobin? One of my arguments is I don't I, no, 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 no. Do you understand the distinction? That is a yes or no question. No. Okay. I don't. So, Unless okay. you tell me. So let me explain to you again. I am going to award you the excess proceeds that have been held. However, the plaintiff is going to be allowed to deduct from that the attorney's fees that they incurred in opposing the, the motion that is before me today, i.e., your motion for an order to distribute interplead funds with interest to sole claimant Nona Tobin and motion for attorney's fees and costs pursuant to NRS 18010 and EDCR 7.60 because the court is finding that all of the additional argument that you made in that motion, if the plaintiff would not have filed an opposition to all of those arguments that you made which were improper arguments and this court already told you were claim precluded, then you would have been able to argue under EDCR 2.20 that they did not file an opposition and therefore that was an admission that those arguments were meritorious. And since this court has already told you that those were not appropriate arguments for you to be making, the court is going to award attorney's fees for that. Now, they will be filing a motion for attorney's fees where they will list out what their attorney's fees are based on this court's ruling right now as to what they're entitled to for their attorney's fees. 
i.e. it took us it would have normally only taken us one hour but it took us five hours to do this it is perfectly appropriate for you to say in your opposition to that motion I don't think that it should have taken him this amount of time because he didn't need to include all of this other additional argument. It is not appropriate for you to say, Mr. Scow always writes really, really long motions and I think he's a fraudster and I don't think that these fees are legitimate. Now, do you understand the distinction? Yes. Good. All right. So, the order from today is going to be I am denying the, I am granting in part the motion for order to distribute the interpled funds. I am denying any interest on those funds. I am denying any attorney's fees and costs. I am also denying Ms. Tobin's motion to correct Nunc Pro Tunc the notices of entry of orders entered on November 30th, 2021 and May 25th, 2022, as the court finds that those orders that I entered were appropriate orders and were based on the findings of fact and conclusions of law that the court found. And to the extent that Ms. Tobin argued that she had filed her competing order um, and that it should be included, that is an incorrect statement because competing orders are not included in the final order. The order is what is ordered by the court, not a competing order. So the court will deny that motion. As it pertains to the um, renewed counter motion filed by Red Rock Financial Services, the renewed counter motion for abuse of process and for a restrictive order against Nona Tobin and for attorney's fees and costs that will be granted in part and denied in part. The court is not going to grant the abuse of process and is not going to enter a restrictive order or declare Ms. Tona, Ms. Tobin a vexatious litigant. The court is going to award attorney's fees and costs for the amount of time that was required by the plaintiff to address the additional argument contained in Ms. Nona Tobin's motion that went outside of what this court had previously said were precluded claims. As it pertains to the response um, to adopt Tobin's proposed final judgment order. Um, I've already dealt with the counter motion, her response for counter motion for restrictive vexatious litigant. I already said that would be denied. Um, and the motion for attorney's fees and costs, that is going to be granted. Her counter motion to adopt Tobin's proposed final judgment order will also be denied. Um, she stated in the record what she wanted in her final judgment order with um, additional amounts to be awarded against Mr. Scow and um, as previously uh, stated, all of those claims are precluded. So that is it for today. Uh, Your Honor, just a clarification. Um, we will prepare an order. Yes, um, Mr. Fauna will... will prepare the order. He will submit it to Ms. Tobin for approval as to form and content. Ms. Tobin, if you do not approve the order, you may file a competing order. However, your competing order is not to include any argument that you want to make. It is only to include the findings that were made by the court and the basis for those findings. If you um, include anything in addition to uh, to your order that is separate and apart from the court's findings um, and the court's orders in this matter, the court is going to issue an order to show cause as to why you should not be held in contempt for wasting the court's time by including arguments 
that are not part of the order that is in front that has been issued by the court. Your Honor, I um, just what and let me also say this. Let me in response and also, Miss uh, Mr. Fonin will will submit the order to you for approval as to form and content. You will have ten days to review that order. If you decide that you are not going to sign off on the order, then you are to send an email back to Mr. Fonin indicating that you are not going to sign the order and that you will be submitting a competing order. Do you understand? Yes. Great. Uh, and Your Honor, just we're going to. Your Honor, if I could just put something on the record real quick. This is Vanessa Turley on behalf of Nation Star. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to let the court know that there was an offer of judgment that had lapsed that we had served to Ms. Tobin that had lapsed. So to the extent that um, the amount that will be awarded to her um, doesn't beat whatever the amount is in the offer of judgment that we will um, execute on that. Well, let me ask you this, Ms. Charlie, you're not making a claim to the excess proceeds, right? No, we're not. Okay. But we but we still plan on executing the offer of judgment. What is your offer of judgment based on? If you didn't We we like had Miss Turley, if you didn't make if you didn't did you file an answer in this? Yes. Okay. If you're not making Um yes, and we did Explain to me the yes, basis for your offer of judgment. We had tendered the entire um, interpleaded funds to Miss Tobin, and that offer of judgment lapsed. Your Honor, how they have no have, standing. I, how I, could, think, I think what she's saying is they, they made an offer of judgment in the amount of the interpled funds. I, I believe that, is that what you're saying, Mr. Elliott? This is Carrie Fawn. Yes, that's what happened. Uh huh. Actually, they made an offer less fees to Red Rock and without standing to make such an offer of judgment. Right, we well, are a named defendant in this. That's not before me right now, so I'm not going to worry about the offer of judgment to the extent it's not before me right now. So. And just to be clear, Your Honor, what we're, go what we're going to do is we will... Like, okay. The last I just wanted to put it on the record. Okay, that's fine. Uh, at, like at the January 19th, we are going to submit a detailed, uh, a very detailed order. And do you want us to include that as the last time all of the, the history of this case, or can we just limit it to what's gone on in this particular case? I think you can limit it to what's gone on in this particular case. However, I do want you to bring in the findings by the Court of Appeals because I Understood. think that that is very relevant to what my decision was from today. Okay, did you, can we do it by reference by yes. including it as an exhibit to the order or do you want us to literally um, cite it? Because we can do either one. We're happy to accommodate. I think I'd like you to cite it. Understood. Okay. Um, and we're going to wait for a transcript because we want to make sure that That's we... That's fine. Uh, and then I guess the final thing is, Your Honor, I, I guess... To the extent the court's inclined to, at this point, you've made it very clear to Ms. Tobin, if she does go down this road again, we would ask that if she does, that we can just submit a vexatious litigant order to this court, rather than having to go through the, the exercise that we've gone through twice now. Um, we would ask that if, in the event that she goes down the road, that, that you have now, for the second time, um, admonished her not to, that we can just submit an order deeming her a vexatious litigant, or at the very least, ex uh, an OSC to... to yeah, because I have to, I do have to do an OSC first. Yeah, I'm required to do an, I mean, uh, declaring somebody a vexatious litigant is a really... Herculean it's task, a Hercu you put it. It's a Herculean task. Um, so, um, but we can, so we can just submit an ex parte application for an OSC at yes. that point? Yes. As, as opposed to filing a motion to have her deemed to just yes. file that ex parte application. Just yeah, because I have to issue the OSC first. Understood. I, I'm just trying to save us the, the, the time and effort of having to do a motion that we've yeah. done twice now for yeah. the 
Ms. Tobin, I want you to understand very, very clearly, this case is almost done, and all of your other cases are essentially done. The, the, the Court of Appeals found that the foreclosure was appropriate and all other actions that you're claiming stem from the foreclosure and are therefore not appropriate. Um, because there, if the foreclosure wasn't wrong, then anything else that was done as a result of the foreclosure was also not wrong. So um, I caution you, um, I, I do not want to declare you a vexatious litigant. I think I've been more than patient and fair, but please do not, please do not file motions and orders that do not, that are frivolous and do not have legal merit to them in the future. All right. Your Honor, um, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, could I ask about the transcript? The, um, he's, he said he was going to wait for the transcript. I've bought all the transcripts up to now and I buy this one. Um, so can I get that? Um, yeah, you need to put in an order for the transcript order. the same way that you have done before. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. Um, I'm gonna give you, um, uh, since you all are waiting for the transcript, I'm not going to do the 7.21 within 14 days. We'll get as quickly as we did delay last time and that was that's, our fault, but that's fine. we will be very diligent in getting this to the. All right, all right, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Your Honor. Have a good day. You too, and apologies to your staff. For thank you. Thank you.